I'd actually like to start off with a demo as soon as I can get up on the big screen. Ah, magic. Cool. So I'm using Photo Booth to do this. Ooh, magic. Um, so, uh, right, you've got the basic intro on me, but this is the internet button, and you can see my like kludgy battery hanging off to the side. But I wanted to have a demo of a connected thing that was really simple, really easy to understand, really quick. So I click it, and the lights turn on. I click it, and the lights turn off, right? Really easy to understand. But what if I put it into a different mode? And now I've got four different options, because actually it's not one button, it's four. So it's more like a game controller pad. And it shows you which one you've clicked. And every time you click one of these buttons, it creates an event online. So if you want it to go to ift and control something there, or I don't know, control your lights or whatever other thing, you know, totally greenfield, send a message to your loved one, order a pizza. And if I put it into still yet another mode, maybe what you really want is for me to reset this and skip back to the mode that I actually wanted to show you. Give me two seconds. There we go. So I really wanted one that would call a cab. And now that Uber's API is open, you can do it and have it actually count down until the cab gets there. But then if it's taking too long, you could cancel it. Um, but the idea of having a really simple device that's very easy to understand, um, that's very approachable, uh, was really what I was going for. And now I'm actually going to flip over to some slides. Hi, yes, gigantic sweaty face on the screen. If only I could find my mouse. Screw it. Screen is too big. Lovely. Cool. So let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, if you're familiar with this music video, uh, OK Go and this giant Rube Goldberg machine, then you've seen a little bit of my work before, uh, and also my dining room chairs. Um, I like to build tools, tools for art, tools that let other people make art. It's really my hobby. It's what I do with my spare time when I can find it. Um, you know, big interaction walls, um, eight people hooked up to EEGs with their conversation being represented by a little simulation up above them. Um, and I just, I like to play with the crowd. I like really good, tangible interactions. And that was my grad work. So uh, this project wasn't, but when I Google for a tangible media group, this project is what comes up first. So I figure it's going to be the uh, most recognizable thing from the group. But yeah, so I did my, my grad work with Hiroshi Ishii on tangible interfaces. Um, making data physical and interactable. And also, it's just a phenomenal demo. Oh, and the other thing is at the Media Lab, we had this, uh, this idea of demo or die. So twice a year, you have to give a demo to a whole bunch of sponsors that come in, and it needs to be really good, and it really needs to work. So highly indoctrinated into this, uh, this demo culture. And just prior to Spark, I worked at Lockatron, which some of you may know. Um, smart locks are hard. Manufacturing is hard. Connected products are hard. These are all like fairly complex problems. And when you stack them all up, it gets even more difficult. Um, all of this to say, um, I'm pretty familiar with the field. So I joined Spark about a year ago. And before joining Spark, um, I really thought that Spark was about dev kits. I thought that was what Spark did, because that's the visible part of Spark. It's these little hardware development platforms. Um, and it's easy to understand why. I mean, the Spark core shipped, uh, I think, more than 50,000 units now to 75 countries. Pretty successful. Um, the ones that you have in your kit now are actually much more attractive. Um, the, uh, the original design is very prototypey. This one, a little better. Um, we are just starting to ship the Photon, which is our successor to the core. Backtrack two steps. You probably don't know what the core is, yeah? Right? General ignorance? Ah, see, now I'm asking questions to the crowd. Um, so uh, the thing in here is the core. So it's sort of like a tiny Arduino with Wi-Fi. But 
better microcontroller and better development platform and over-the-air uh, software updates so you can program it without plugging it in. Um, and a really, really easy software environment to develop in. So instead of needing to write a whole bunch of stuff to manage a TCP stack, you say spark.publish and it just works. Or spark.function and now you can access that, uh, that function over the API or from your app or wherever else. Uh, so the Photon, it's our successor, costs half as much, works better. Um, no longer has Wi-Fi setup problems as far as we can tell, which is just a friggin' coup in this space because Wi-Fi setup is what kills almost all the consumers and turns it from being a product into being trash. Um, and yeah, we're nearing 16,000 pre-orders on it. Um, and it's got this little module on board, the P0, which is our own little like Wi-Fi and microcontroller package. Um, and that costs $10 in volume. Actually, it costs $10 in any volume. If you buy 10 of them from us, they'll still only cost $10. And if you buy 10,000, we'll probably still talk, charge you $10, but we can talk about it. Um, so you can prototype on the platform, and then you can scale up and actually make 10,000 or 100,000 of these things. Um, we move a little quickly. So we've also announced the Electron uh, and raised a nice little Kickstarter. That is our cellular development kit. So now you can do cellular just as easily as you do Wi-Fi. And this also forced us to become a mobile carrier. So we're now an MVNO. We will sell you, well, we'll give you SIM cards and then charge you a pretty cheap rate uh, to get on cellular. It's basically a whisper net for everything. Um, so yeah, I get it. Spark is dev kits. But we do a few more things. Um, this is one of the graphics that's been in, like, in our biz dev sec uh, slideshows for a while. Um, it is complex. So let me show you a little bit simpler. Um, little Spark devices go in the devices over here. Big cloud service up there uh, handles a lot of the nastiness, infrastructure, scaling, security, um, and then apps, because you need some way to control it, interact with it, see the data. Um, but this is still, I don't know, not quite simple enough. My alarm clock doesn't know that I've been awake for an hour and a half, sitting perfectly cross-legged waiting to recite this line. To make things worse, I'm out of milk, and my fridge didn't realize it, so it didn't order more. And my front door didn't lock behind me automatically, protecting my home from intruders. All in all, I'm having a pretty bad day, and the things around me aren't helping. But you can't blame them. They don't really know any better. You see, most products are designed for discrete tasks, to solve simple problems. Your coffee maker doesn't know how many cups you've had this morning, or why you take sugar on Tuesdays but not Wednesdays. It doesn't know how you're feeling today. Your coffee maker knows two things, on and off. It just is. But there's this new idea called the Internet of Things, where products from toys to parking meters come online and gain access to the web. But how would a coffee maker deal with the enormous amount of data that makes up the internet? You see, products like these have tiny brains called microcontrollers. A microcontroller might have the processing power of an Apple II, which is why I can't expect my waffle iron to follow me on Twitter. You could upgrade to one of these. This is the processor from a smartphone but this can cost 10 times as much as a microcontroller, which would make for a pretty expensive electric toothbrush. So how do we make a product smart but not expensive? Well, these days we've got the cloud, which actually looks like this. The idea behind cloud computing is that a network of servers can tackle hard problems that are tough to deal with on your machine. So when you want your toaster to tell you today's forecast, the cloud can scrape the web for weather data, which means all your toaster has to figure out is how to print on toast. So anyway, we're Spark. We make an operating system for cloud-connected products. An operating system that runs here, not here, which helps you make a smarter product without breaking the bank. Plus, we've got these great developer tools that make it easy to build a connected product so that engineers, designers, artists, and students can join the Internet of Things. So now your products can do more. They can communicate with one another, they can learn your preferences, and they can even show intelligence. Not the kind of intelligence where you can press a button to turn on and off your lights from your iPhone. The kind of intelligence where your lights turn on automatically because the sun went down, 
and you want to be able to read in peace. The kind of intelligence that gets out of your way to help make your life better. This is Spark, and we help people create amazing connected products. Uh, and beyond that, we're also pushing a couple other directions. Scaling, you know, make 100,000 of a thing, and how you manage 100,000 units out in the field. Um, so basically, we do the difficult parts. We try to like handle all of the really nasty complexities, like being a utility. Um, so all of the awful, nasty things. Um, so there are a lot of pieces. There's a whole lot of trying to educate the public about what those are, just because people are asking for them and they don't really know what they are asking about or what they need. And so there's just a lot of explaining that happens. Um, and it's really just too difficult for most people to get started because you have a problem like this where there are wires, right? There's some kind of barrier to plugging in wires. And yeah, you have to learn to read diagrams and you have to do it, um, but it's just a huge barrier. So when I joined Spark, uh, that looked like a pretty serious problem to me, and I started thinking about the demo that I really wanted to be able to go around with, which is just a little button. Um, and I wanted a button because it's really simple. There's a really direct mapping. You click it, and a thing happens. There's no uh, complex logic. There's not a lot of um, programming to it. You can just ship it with all of the code on it that you already need, so you don't even have to program it. Uh, and it's self-contained, so there's no additional wiring, there are no, there are no uh, sensors or other things you need to add to it. Um, and I wanted something that was real. Um, I find that there are a lot of vaporware demos and a lot of things that you're just never going to be able to get into your hands, and I don't know, I just don't agree with it. Um, robust and portable, because I do end up giving demos on planes, because you're sitting next to somebody and they're interesting and you've got a cool thing and if there's no power and no Wi-Fi and it doesn't work, it's a stupid demo. You've got a little brick of material that does nothing. Um, so I like things that are fully offline. By the way, this, not currently on Wi-Fi. Um, I can hold down a button and turn it on to Wi-Fi, but it'll work offline. It's not actually doing um, the Wi-Fi connected parts right now, but it works. I can, exp I can tell you a story about it. Um, and I think things have to be magical. I just do. It's like one of my basic design criteria. If I don't hide little features in there that just make me happy and will make people like me happy when they find them, then I'm not happy with my job. Um, so partway through this process, I realized that it was becoming a product, that it wasn't just a little thing that I was going to build and make five of, um, but it was something that maybe other people would want to use. So I started designing. So I spent some time in Eagle made a little board design, ran off some early boards. Uh, you'll also notice that it's self-documenting. The silk screen tells you where everything is in case you want to start hacking at it. It tells you where the buttons connect. It tells you where to get power or ground. It tells you where the LEDs are. And yeah, decided that we needed to wrap it in plastic, just make it a little bit nicer, diffuse the light, make it a more pleasant experience. You can't really see here, but it's also got some Braille-like encodings on it, so you know what the button numbers are when you're setting it up. And we like packaging at Spark. We like things that are nice when you open them. So they're coming in these nice little tins with printing on them and everything you need in a box. Uh, and also makes a great carrying case. But I think it's not complete until you have the software side of it too. You know, I can ship you a chunk of material, and if you have to learn to program to use this thing that's supposed to be simple, then I've screwed up. So using if, if this, then that, for those of you familiar, um, you can do a whole bunch of things without ever writing any code. So they're shipping with code on them that lets them talk to if, and then with if, you can just create these little recipes by pointing and clicking and setting a few, uh, a few values. So if you want it to email your loved one when you click one button, it's you know, a five minute process. If you really want to get into the code, then I've also written a library for it. So instead of needing to uh, do digital writes and digital reads, um, you can just say things like LED on, and, uh, and if button on, do something. Uh, and nice little examples all the way down, walks you through basically all of the features of the device. So you can learn on your own, and they're all heavily commented, so you can even teach yourself to program just from the button. Uh, so we actually use them at a lot of workshops just because it is um, that much easier to get started. There's no wiring, and that's actually one of the big hurdles that we see with workshops 
is getting people to plug the wires in the right place and to, to stop being scared of the wires. So once you get rid of the wires, it's just so much simpler. Um, question is, what, what should you build? Yes, there's a question. Thank God. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this actually gets into um, some of the deeper uh, haptic theory. So uh, with your phone, this is temporarily multiplexed. It's different all the time. Uh, and that's not really how people are wired up. Uh, you're really looking for spatially multiplexed things. Uh, a hammer stays a hammer, and a screwdriver stays a screwdriver, and you remember where you put them. So it's really nice to have things that are dedicated purpose. So like the button beside the door calls the cab. You know, and so when you're going out the door, instead of pulling up my phone, opening up Uber, going through their, their message flow, I hit the button by the door and it calls me a cab, uh, usually on the corporate account because I'm putting one in our office. Uh, so other uh, functions are like the, the dash button, which is the little Amazon thing. And their idea is that you want to be able to reorder stuff in the moment that it makes sense. So you put a little... Um, you know, laundry detergent reorder button on your washing machine because that's when you realize that you're out of laundry detergent. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there's a, there's a bit of like business Trojan horsing here. Uh, it's a really good way to build things that work well and show people an experience without needing to get a deal through with, uh, with a major manufacturer. So uh, it takes forever to work with a company like GE. And so, you know, in three years, we could have these buttons built into their machine. But right now, I can just give you a little device that you stick on. Um, it's certainly a stopgap measure. It is not the, like, eventual utopian dream of the, uh, the smart home. Um, so generally, I think that demos are for communication. If they're designed well, you can really communicate well. Um, and I feel like I should have more things. I really blitzed through because I didn't really want to keep you guys past lunch. Question. <laughs> I do. You know, it's a good question. Um, because when you plug USB into it here, uh, that would collide with it uh, and obscure it. So it's the clock positions except 12. So usually when I click up here at the top, I make these two LEDs turn on. Uh, and actually in the one that we're shipping, there's an unpopulated pad. There's basically a place for the LED where you can solder your own on uh, if you've got a use case where it's not required. But yeah, keen insight. The, uh, the other thing that you guys haven't seen, except accidentally a second ago, um, was this mode. So it's got a buzzer in it, too, if you want to make a thing that's horrible and beepy and like your kids love but you hate. But check it out. This is not just playing random stuff. It's got an accelerometer, so it knows what its position is. So I'm reading gravity right now. And if I thump it the right way, and I can kind of make it play. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The buzzer just makes it so much more fun. You can have it play little chip tunes. Um, get back to Mario and Zelda. And the accelerometer lets you uh, wake it up. That's actually the, the key reason it's there, is so you can put everything to sleep so it draws very little power so the batteries last forever. And then when you bump it or somebody clicks it, then it wakes up, gets online, does what it needs to do, and then goes back to sleep. God, depends on how big a battery you put on it. Um, but that's, that's always the thing. And especially with Wi-Fi, you don't want to build battery-powered Wi-Fi products. It's just a, it's one of those pitfalls that a lot of people are falling into right now. Wi-Fi, as, as a protocol, is just too power-hungry. Um, with Wi-Fi, we always try to encourage people to have it plugged in in some way. Um, and if you can't, then there are ways to work around it. I mean, you can keep it dead asleep, except when you really need to send in info. So if you're doing 
um, sensing or sampling or something, then you can usually do it. But for a lot of things that you want it to, where you want it to be always on, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Oh God, until the battery just gives up and dies. Um, I would say, well, and it depends on the size of the battery. So I'd say something like um, like four double A's, which is a pretty standard like battery loadout for a thing these days. Um, probably lasts you, yeah, between six months and a year, um, because it'll stay off Wi-Fi. It'll keep the microcontroller in a really deep sleep state. Keep the LEDs off. Burns basically no power. There's a little bit of trickle, but that's about it. Can't, can't you just plug it into the wall? Yeah, you can. And plugging it into the wall is, is always the best way to go with Wi-Fi. Um, but everyone wants to make things that are battery powered. It's just one of the peculiarities of the industry. So you mentioned that you're using these uh, kits in uh, workshops a lot. Can yeah. you tell us some of the better ideas that you've seen come out of those workshops? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you one that I've seen more than once. Um, bathroom occupancy indicators and sort of like um, reminders. So you have one inside a, a bathroom stall, particularly in offices with just a single bathroom and a lot of people, uh, and it lets your coworkers uh, tell you that they need to get in and lets you respond that, you know, it might be another minute. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty bad, but I've seen it um, two or three times independently now, which is... Well, I mean, at least they're not talking to you or banging on the door. I think it's like, it's, well, right. I mean, it's, it's clearly an infrastructure problem, and you're trying to work around it in the, uh, in the meantime. And yeah. Hey there. Um, what are some other use cases that you've seen that you feel deliver real value to people? Um, there's definitely a, a class of things that are sort of more generally interesting, like, hey, it's a button that connects the things. But have you seen any specific applications of your technology, of Spark technology, that oh, sure. you know, transformed the life of an elderly person living at home or, or really sort of helped uh, users? Yeah. I've seen a couple, a couple I can't talk about. Um, but one of the, the interesting ones that I've seen is more infrastructure monitoring. It's, uh, it's paying attention to power consumption and it's paying attention to water use and leakage. Um, one of the, the interesting ones called Water Hero actually has a temperature sensor and uh, a flow meter and a valve that can shut off. And so it can tell if your, uh, if your pipes are going to freeze and send you notifications that that's going to happen. And if there are leaks in your house or a pipe bursts, it can shut off the water. Um, and these, these other little fixes to the system. Um, what I'm really looking for, why I'm working at Spark, um, I like to make the tools easy enough to use that the good ideas get done. And I haven't seen the best idea yet. Um, what I'm really looking for is a thing that we, that we never expected, where it's not adding Wi-Fi to a coffee maker, it's using Wi-Fi to deliver a thing that we couldn't have conceived before, in which having experienced it, we couldn't live without. And that's, that's what I'm really watching out for. Smart locks is potentially one of those things where it sounds, uh, people like to use them in dystopian scenarios because it's pretty easy to scare someone with it. But when you've got a door that knows who you are and unlocks for you when you walk up, uh, it changes the way you perceive space. Um, so with Lockatron, one of my weird discoveries was, uh, was that I gave all of my friends access to my house. Like, I wouldn't give all of my friends keys. It'd feel weird. But I gave all of my friends access to my place because there's a little bit of accountability um, and also because why wouldn't I? It's space that I don't mind if they use. Um, and so you go from a lot of little like locked up boxes to a bunch of spaces that you have permissions to. All right, well, I'm gonna make you watch this video. Hey Christine. guys, this is Christine. Today we're gonna do a demonstration of publish and subscribe through the cloud using Spark cores and internet buttons. We've created what we're calling the Spark Reactor, and that's hooked up to this repulsor and this servo. What's basically going to happen is when we charge the, and fire the repulsor, it publishes an event to the cloud. The servo and the Spark Reactor are subscribed to the cloud for that event, 
and they're going to react when uh, the event is published. So let's do it. <laughs> and there you have it. Get back to work! <laughs> so we're teaching two workshops this afternoon. Christine, who's in the back and was in the video, uh, will be running the workshops and you should come by. We'll show you how to use that maker kit you got.